We'll be taking a look at the lab exploiting cross-site scripting to capture passwords. Similar to other labs, this lab is designed to be solved using Burp Collaborator, which is only available with the professional edition of Burp Suite. Having said that, there is also an alternative solution to this lab, which doesn't need Burp Collaborator. We're going to look at both solutions in this lab walkthrough. I'll do something a little bit unorthodox for these walkthroughs, which is I'm going to look at the solution before solving the lab. And the reason I'm doing this is because I don't think the purpose of this lab is really to find the solution. In fact, there are numerous walkthroughs online where this particular exploit has been copied and pasted into the comment window on a blog, which we'll see shortly. But then there's very little explanation on why this generates an exploit. So in this case, I'm going to start with the payload, then we'll explain what type of situation this payload is designed to target. Okay, let's get some context to this by firing up the lab. So this particular lab is simulating a blog. We can visit various posts on the blog. We can leave a comment. The idea here is that this particular comment field is heavily susceptible to cross-site scripting attacks. By that, we mean it appears to have no protection whatsoever. We can make use of angle brackets and inject arbitrary JavaScript to execute on the victim's browser without any issue whatsoever. Let's take a look at this payload. Now we'll notice the first part of this is actually a HTML snippet. And all we're doing here is creating an input field, one for the username and one for the password. We're listening for an on-change event in other words, we're asking the browser to wait and see if any information gets filled into the password field. We can then say if this, now keep in mind in this context, this refers to the element that we're inside, which is this password input. It's looking at the value of that, and then it's ascertaining if it has a length. So by default, if the password field is not filled in, then it won't have any length. If this dot value dot length evaluates to true, it means that there has been a password entered into the password field. Now, if there's a password entered into the password field, the idea is we can dispatch that to an attacker controlled endpoint and we make use of the JavaScript fetch API for this. Now, notice that we have burp collaborator subdomain. We have to replace this with the value of the attacker controlled endpoint. And the idea is that we can use burp suites collaborator for this. So we will need Burp Suite Professional for this. If you don't have Burp Suite Professional, don't worry too much. We're going to have a look at the alternate solution as well. So if we head on over to the collaborator, we have this option here, payloads to generate. And in this case, the term payload simply refers to our own personal endpoint that we can use to collect those HTTP requests, which will be initiated by the fetch API from the victim's browser. So when we click copy to clipboard, we're actually copying our own personal attacker controlled endpoint. And we can simply replace all of the capital letters with that endpoint. We then specify some details. We define some of the arguments for the fetch API. So it's going to be a post request. We have no cause mode set in the burp suite solution. And here's the key, the body of the post request is going to be username.value. We are concatenating that to a colon character. And the only purpose of the colon character is as a delimiter. So we can tell where the username ends and the password starts We're looking for this colon. We're going to concatenate after the colon with this.value. Remember this.value actually refers to the password. So we are sending a post request to the burp collaborator endpoint and it's going to have as its body a string which reads username colon password. Let's fill in some other information here. Now keep in mind the idea is that anytime we post a new comment, the lab is going to simulate a victim visiting the page with the comment. The cross-site scripting attack will then be launched within the context of the victim's session. Let's just fill out the extra information here for the verification. Let's post the comment. So if we head back to Burp Collaborator, we can see that a HTTP request has in fact come in. And if there isn't a HTTP request, we can make use of the poll now option. But the idea is that polling occurs 
at set intervals. So we may not need to click the poll now button if the request has already hit the collaborator. By the way, it may seem a little bit unusual to poll for HTTP requests because they're usually something that just come into our app. We don't poll for them. The reason why we poll with Burp Collaborator is because these HTTP requests are not coming directly to Burp Suite. They're being sent to a certain subdomain. That's the payload that we generated. So the endpoint is not actually Burp Suite Professional. It's the subdomain itself. We can then poll to see if that endpoint has received any HTTP requests. That's just a small point. It's not too important for actually completing the lab. Now let's take a look at this HTTP request. If we click on the tab request to collaborate, we can see some of the details of this request. And we see that we have an administrator and password string. We're of course interested in the password. And for now I'm going to solve the lab, but we really haven't explained how or why this is working at this stage. So this is really just to make sure our session doesn't time out and there's perhaps a different password or something. So let's do this first so we can see that the lab has been solved. Let's now head back to the beginning and let's head to a blog post and let's take another look at that payload. If you think about it, we are adding a HTML snippet to the page and we can see an example of that. So we have the username input field that we created and we had the password input field that we created. I'll also repaste a copy of the payload that we've just used to exploit this lab. And notice for the input type equals password, we have an on change event. Now you might get the impression if you didn't think about this lab in depth that the user visits the page and all of a sudden their username and password are just automatically submitted as part of a HTTP request. In other words, very similar to previous labs where we've stolen the user's cookie, because obviously as part of this cross-site scripting attack, we are acting within the context of the victim session, and we have access to session-specific information, such as the user's cookie or session ID. And it's possible to automatically submit that session information as part of a HTTP request. So you might think here also that the idea is that the username and the password are stored as part of the session and they're automatically sent, but they're not. When we look at the exploit here, we can see that fetch is only called on a specific event, which is the on change event specifically for the password field. Now, this is obviously not the correct login box. This is not somewhere where a user would attempt to log in. In fact, they should already be logged in at this stage, more than likely. So the question is, what would cause that password field to be filled in? And there are two answers for this. One is related to the lab. The other is not related, at least not directly. So to start with the unrelated answer, this could be part of a phishing attack, right? If we could make our login and password box look really legitimate, there's a chance that a user comes here and they just start filling in their username and password because they don't understand what that should look like, or they think it's a genuine login page, and they decide to enter their username and password automatically. Before they've even clicked the submit button, if there is one, that username and password is automatically going to be sent to the attacker controlled endpoint. And that's because we have this on change event. So as soon as the password field changes, if it has any sort of length, then that fetch API is going to be initiated and that information will be sent to the endpoint. However, that's not what this lab is about. This is not about a phishing attack where the user incorrectly fills in an attacker controlled form. This is about something else. It's to do with automatic credentials supplied by the browser. So we're likely familiar with the idea that different browsers allow us to save passwords and we have the ability to automatically fill in usernames and passwords, depending on the domain. So what can happen here is that the user visits the site. The browser says, okay, this is XYZ domain. I can see a username and password field here. Let me try and be helpful for the user and automatically input the username and password into that field to save the user time. Of course, what's the problem? Well, as soon as the password field has been filled out, then all of a sudden, this dot value dot length equals true. The fetch API is initiated 
and that username and password is sent to the attacker controlled endpoint. So the user didn't put it there. The browser automatically placed the credentials in the form. And we don't even need to submit those credentials by means of a button for the exploit to be valid because it listens for this on change event. In other words, as soon as the browser enters the password, boom, it's now sent to the attacker controlled endpoint. This idea of automatically filled passwords is key to understanding this exploit. If you have, for example, a walkthrough on this particular lab, but don't mention the idea of automatically filled passwords, it completely defeats the whole purpose of the exploit. This particular exploit is deliberately targeted towards the automatic filling of credentials by browsers. And to some extent, we could also use this as a phishing attack, but the purpose of this lab is that it exploits automatically filled credentials by the victim's browser. Okay, so what happens if we don't have Burp Collaborator? Well, instead of sending a HTTP request via fetch, we can cause the user to post a comment on the blog with their username and password credentials. The only small difficulty here is that this form generates a cross-site request forgery token. So we also need to grab that from the victim's page and also supply that as part of the post request to the endpoint that creates a new comment. We're not going to go into detail on how the cross-site request forgery works. That's because this was explored in a previous lab. So if you're interested to understand more about how the token and the bypassing of the cross-site request forgery protection works, check out the lab with the title Exploiting Cross-Site Scripting to Steal Cookies. However, we will have a look at the payload right now and just explain very quickly how that payload works. So this is a sample payload. We're going to be copy and pasting this as a comment post. First of all, notice we have the username and password input fields. That's just regular HTML. We're listening for the onChange event and we're passing a function called hacks to the onChange event. We're then using script tags to designate a section of JavaScript where we're going to define this function hacks. First of all, we grab the CSRF token using document.getElementsByNameCSRF index zero dot value. So that's the short version of how you grab that CSRF token. We're then going to grab the value of the form. So we're going to say username equals, and I'll grab the input value for username. We're going to grab the password. Again, we're just using vanilla JavaScript to access various aspects of the DOM. So we've grabbed the username and password, and we've assigned them to a variable. We're then creating a new form using JavaScript. So we can make use of the form data class. We are attaching the CSRF token, the post ID, the comment. So here for the comment, we are using a string literal and we're passing in the variables username and password, which we previously extracted using vanilla JavaScript. The rest of the data is just arbitrary. We've called the victim victim. We've put in an email, we've put in an address. We then make use of the fetch API. So the endpoint we're interested in is post comment. We're using method post, and then we are attaching that form data as the body property in this case. Now, one potential issue with this code is that it doesn't actually check to see if the password field has any length. You could very easily code that into the exploit here. It wouldn't be too difficult. In this case, we know that the password always has length because that's simply how the victim is behaving. Besides, keep in mind that nothing is actually triggered until that on change event fires anyway. So it's not as if even a user with no information for the username and password will trigger the fetch API HTTP request because this will only trigger on change for the password field. So it's still fairly good in terms of code. So let's copy the exploit. We are just going to force browse to a blog post that doesn't have an exploit. So you can see we've timed out from the lab, we'll just reconnect. So this is the post with the ID of eight. There's no exploits because we refreshed the lab. So let's post in our exploit code. Let's fill in the rest of the data. Let's post this comment. In the background, the lab is simulating the victim visit to the page. Let's go back to blog. Let's scroll down. So we can see the victim has created a post, username administrator, password is there. 
Once again, we can just copy that password. We can head to the login section in my account, username administrator, password. We've extracted it here. And that's the lab solved without using Burp Collaborator. So key takeaways here, this lab is designed to help us understand potential issues with autofilling of credentials by the browser. That's the whole point of this exploit. The user has visited the site, the browser has automatically filled in the username and password, which then triggers the cross-site scripting, which sends those credentials to an attacker controlled endpoint. If we don't think about the auto-filling of username and passwords when solving this lab, it completely defeats the objective of what this exploit is trying to teach us. Thanks very much for watching, guys. Hope it was helpful.